gremlins welcome back to my channel for another episode of history with miss barney hope you guys are doing great thanks so much for getting your quiz in yesterday i will be doing shout outs for our final video on friday so stay tuned for that in attendance question news alexander hamilton defeated the jamestown colonist so he will be moving on to the final He's going to be going up against either George Washington or Kit Carson to find out who the most interesting person we talked about this year was. So speaking of Hamilton, I don't know if you guys saw, but I guess Disney Plus is adding the Hamilton musical to their streaming site in like July. So lots of people are excited about that and you should totally watch it if you have Disney Plus. If you don't have Disney Plus, I'm in the same boat, so I will also not be watching it. So don't feel too lonely. All right. Anyway, let's get going with the lesson today. We are finishing up Lincoln's assassination story today by talking about what happened to John Wilkes Booth. So just to review, um, John Wilkes Booth was a very famous actor back in the day and then he was very like racist, pro-confederates, and so once the confederates like lost the war he decided he was gonna kill Lincoln. So he shot Lincoln in Ford's theater. Um, Lincoln didn't die right away from that wound. Actually he was brain dead for a few hours before passing away. And even though Booth broke his leg jumping down onto the stage, he actually got away and he escaped Washington DC with one of his henchmen who was named Harold. He was going to the South in the hopes that he would be able to like find shelter there and that they would open up their arms and just welcome him down there as this hero who killed Lincoln. So Booth and Harold, his henchmen, are traveling in the South, are posing as wounded Confederate soldiers, and eventually they decide to seek shelter at a barn um, owned by the Garrett family. Now a massive manhunt was underway to capture Booth because everybody knew it was him. He was very famous and a ton of people had seen him. He had made a huge spectacle about it. So everyone's on the lookout for Booth and eventually a tip leads some Union soldiers to the Garrett barn. These Union soldiers were led by, I don't remember their names, let me look at this. They were led by Edward Doherty, Luther Baker, and Everton Conger. Um, and so they go and they're gonna do their best to capture Booth. So without further ado, let's find out what happened. Edward Doherty, Luther Baker, and Everton Conger dropped from their saddles, leaped up onto the porch, and pounded on the door. Richard Garrett climbed from his bed and walked downstairs in his night clothes. In the tobacco barn, David Harold panicked. You had better give up, he urged. No, no, Booth insisted. I will suffer death first. Conger demanded of Richard Garrett, where are the two men who stopped here at your house? Garrett turned out to be very reluctant to reveal Booth and Harold's whereabouts. Even the threat of hanging did not move Richard Garrett to reveal where the prey was hiding. Then Doherty seized John Garrett and put a revolver to his head, ordering him to tell where the assassins were. In the barn, he revealed, they are in the tobacco barn. The soldiers rushed to surround the barn. Baker ordered John Garrett to enter the barn and take the weapons from the fugitives. John had seen Booth's weapons and knew he would not hesitate to take revenge for his family's inhospitality and betrayal. No, he would not be the assassin's last victim. Baker explained that the mission was not optional. If he did not go to the barn, Baker would burn all of the Garrett property. He would end this affair with a bonfire and shooting match. Baker unlocked the barn door, opened it a little with Booth's invisible just a few yards away. He clutched his pistols tightly, but held his fire. Baker seized John Garrett and half guided, half pushed him through the door and closed it behind him. John Garrett urged Booth, still hidden in the dark, to give himself up. Like a ghostly vision, John Wilkes Booth's pale, haunting face emerged from the darkness as his voice exploded. Damn you. You have betrayed me. If you don't get out of here, I will shoot you. Get out of this barn at once. The assassin reached behind his back for one of his revolvers. A terrified John Garrett turned and ran, escaping the barn. Finally, at the climax of a 12-day manhunt that had gripped the nation, a heavily armed patrol of the 16th New York Cavalry had cornered Lincoln's assassin. Surprisingly, instead of ordering their men to rush the barn and take Booth, they first sent an unarmed civilian to disarm him. When that scheme failed, they attempted to talk him out of the barn. Why didn't 26 armed soldiers, under cloak of darkness, charge two civilians hiding in a barn? Surely the honor of capturing Lincoln's assassin was worth the risk of a few casualties. Baker shouted an ultimatum to the fugitives. I want you to surrender. If you don't, I will burn this barn down in 15 minutes. Boo stepped to the front of the barn and peered through a space between two boards, examining the manhunters. Who are you? What do you want? Whom do you want? We want you, Baker replied, and we know who you are. Give up your arms and come out. 
Booth continued to stall, asking for time to make a decision. Baker agreed to the delay. Harold decided to give himself up. He thought he could talk his way out of trouble and just go home. In his mind, he wasn't guilty of anything. Booth had shot Lincoln, and he had just been along for the ride. Booth, however, refused to let Harold go. Harold pleaded with Booth, begging to be released. Finally, Booth relented, denouncing his companion. You damned coward, go, go. Harold had stood by Booth, even when he had a chance to leave. He had rendered loyal service, and it was harsh to call him a coward now. Harold turned away from Booth and faced the door. He thrust one empty hand at a time through the door frame where the soldiers could see them. Doherty sprung to the door, seized Harold by the wrist, and yanked him through the doorway. He frisked him to make sure he was unarmed and, like a schoolmaster taking a disobedient student by the collar, marched him away from the barn. Now there remained only John Wilkes Booth, still at bay and armed. For Booth, this was his final and greatest performance, not just for the small audience of soldiers at Garrett's barn, but also for history. He had already committed the most daring public murder in American history. Indeed, he had performed it, fully staged before an audience at Ford's Theater. Tonight, he would script his own end with a performance that equaled his triumph at Ford's. Baker and Conger argued against waiting until morning to take Booth. In a few hours, the light of dawn would illuminate the Manhunters and make them into perfect, visible targets. Booth could hardly miss. One of Doherty's sergeants, Boston Corbett, volunteered for a suicide mission. He would slip into the barn alone and fight Booth one-on-one. -on -one. Three times Corbett volunteered. Each time Doherty ordered Corbett back to his position. Conger and Baker had another plan. They wanted to burn the barn. The flames and smoke would do the job of flushing Booth out without harm to the men. Conger ordered the Garrett sons to collect a few armfuls of straw and pile them against the side of the barn. The rustling sounds alerted Booth, who rushed to the side of the noise. He ordered the Garretts to move away from the barn or he would shoot them. They quickly retreated out of pistol range. Anticipating the barn was about to be burned down, Booth challenged all of his pursuers to honorable combat on open ground. He had just challenged 26 men, a lieutenant, and two detectives to a duel. Baker declined the offer. Well, my brave boys, prepare a stretcher for me, Booth replied merrily. Hunger bent over and lit the kindling. The pine twigs and straw burst into flames that licked the dry, weathered boards. Soon the barn caught fire, and within minutes the corner of the barn blazed brightly. The fire cast a yellow-orange glow that flickered eerily across the faces of the soldiers. Booth could see them clearly now, but held his fire. As the fire grew, it lit the inside of the barn so that for the first time the soldiers could also see their prey in the gaps between the slats. The assassin had three choices. Stay in the barn and burn alive blow his brains out, or script his own honorable end by hobbling out the front door and doing battle with the manhunters, welcoming death but risking capture. Booth decided it was better to die than be taken back to Washington to face justice. He did not wish to bear the spectacle of a trial that would put him on public display for the amusement of the press and curiosity seekers. Nor did he wish to endure the rituals of a hanging, being bound and blindfolded, parading past his own coffin and open grave, climbing the steps of the scaffold. The shameful death of a common criminal was not for him. It was far better to perish here. Who stood in the corner of the barn, awkwardly balancing the carbine in one hand, a pistol in the other, and a crutch under one arm. Measuring how quickly the flames were engulfing him, he hopped forward, the carbine in his right hand, the butt plate balanced against his hip. Outside the barn, Conger, Baker, Doherty, and the cavalrymen tensed for action. No one could endure the hot flames and choking smoke for long. They expected the door to swing open at any moment and see Booth emerge with his hands held up or his pistols blazing. Boston Corbett watched the assassins every move inside the barn. Unseen by Booth, he walked up to one side of the barn and peeked between one of the gaps in the barn walls. As the flames grew brighter, Corbett could see his prey clearly. The sergeant watched Booth and drew his pistol. Booth leveled the carbine against his hip, as though preparing to bring it into firing position. Corbett poked the barrel of his revolver through the slit in the wall, aimed at Booth, and fired. The soldiers heard one shot. Instantly, Booth dropped the carbine and crumpled to his knees. Like sprinters cued by a starting gun, Baker rushed into the barn with Conger hot at his heels. Conger seized the assassin's pistol. They lifted Booth from the floor, carried him under the trees a few yards from the door, and laid him on the grass. Though unable to move, 
Booth opened his eyes and attempted to speak. Conger called for water, poured a little into Booth's mouth, and he spit it out. The assassin could not swallow. He was completely paralyzed. For the first time in his life, the great actor was at a loss for words. His voice was silenced by the bullet that had quickly passed through his neck and spinal column. After several attempts at speaking, Booth whispered, Tell mother I die for my country. It was hard to hear his faint voice above the roar of the fire, the shouts of the men, and the snorting of the horses. As the blaze in the barn grew to an inferno, the soldiers retreated to the garret house, moving Booth's limp body onto the porch near the bench where Booth had sat, smoked, napped, and chatted over the previous two days. Blood seeped from the entry and exit wounds in his neck and pooled under his head, staining the floorboards. Doherty brought David Harold to the porch, bound his hands, and tied him to a tree about two yards from where Booth lay. Harold would have a front row seat for the climax of the chase for Lincoln's killer. Booth suffered extreme pain whenever he was moved. Kill me, he begged the soldiers. Kill me. Kill me. We don't want to kill you, Conger reassured him. We want you to get well. He was sincere. They wanted Booth alive so they could bring him back to Washington as a prize. Stanton and others were certain Booth was merely an agent of a Confederate conspiracy. Following the swearing-in of Andrew Johnson as the 17th president, Stanton had issued a reward for Jefferson Davis and other Confederate officials, naming them as assassination conspirators. But because of someone under Conger's command, it was obvious Booth was not going back to Washington alive. Who fired that shot? Conger demanded to know. Boston Corbett came forward, snapped to attention, saluted Conger, and proclaimed that he had shot Booth, and God had directed him to do it. He claimed he opened fire because he thought Booth was going to shoot the soldiers. He did it for the direct lives of the fellow troopers. In fact, the men of the 16th New York had not been ordered to hold their fire. Conger, Baker, and Doherty had failed to give them any orders at all on the subject. As a non-commissioned officer, Corbett exercised his own discretion and shot Booth. A local doctor was summoned. He examined Booth, who lapsed in and out of consciousness. He proclaimed the wound was mortal. Booth would not recover. Conger rifled through Booth's pockets, then placed the contents in a handkerchief. Booth's diary, money, keys, compass, small knife, and tobacco would be taken to Stanton as treasure and evidence. My hands, Booth whispered. Baker raised them for Booth to see. For the last time, John Wilkes Booth saw the hands, now helpless, that had slain Abraham Lincoln. Gathering his remaining strength, he looked at his hands and spoke his last words. Useless. Useless. Booth's lips turned purple and his throat swelled. He gasped. The rising sun nudged above the horizon and colored the eastern sky, flooding the garret farm with light, which shone on Booth's face. The stage grew dark for him. His body shuddered. John Wilkes Booth was dead. The 12 day chase for Abraham Lincoln's assassin was over. And so that is the end of John Wilkes Booth. And yeah, this remains like one of those infamous moments in American history. Lincoln was mourned and he's gone down as like one of our best presidents of all time because he saved the country and he fought for freedom and equality for all. All right guys, so go answer the questions on this video. Tomorrow you are going to play a Kahoot that is gonna review a lot of stuff we talked about this year. There are going to be prizes involved for the winners of Kahoot, so try your best, okay? But anyway, stay tuned for the Kahoots tomorrow and I will see you guys on Friday. Bye, gremlins.